Hallelujah. So my name is David Fleming. I'm uh, coming from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Enjoy coming to this church. I feel like I'm like part of the family. I feel like I'm, I'm part of you guys. And so uh, we'll go way back with these two. Uh, many years back to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then my wife actually goes back to uh, uh, growing up in Canada with Sean. So my wife is not able to be here this week. I apologize. We were close. We were headed this way. Uh, we just had a couple things come up. So my boys are at home. You remember Nathan. Nathan is four, coming close to five. He's getting ready for a birthday party. You guys are all invited. <laughs> he wants to invite everyone he knows in the entire world. Oh, he wants you to bring a gift, actually. Is what he <laughs> And then his brother will turn three uh, a couple weeks later, Andrew. And uh, so we're, we're having a good time with them, but they are home getting stronger. Uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew is recovering, took him to the doctor a couple times this week, uh, hurt his arm, and so uh, he's getting stronger, he's getting better, but it just seemed good keeping them at home. But they send their greetings. They're really disappointed. But for some reason, they love coming to California. I don't know why, but they just love it. They talk about California year-round. Can we go to California? Uh, they really believe you guys are their friends, too. <laughs> I took them on a trip. We drove to uh, North Carolina back in October. And uh, so they don't quite have their sense of geography. He's only four, right? Can you imagine that? doesn't know where the states are. And uh, so when I'm driving to North Carolina, he kept asking, Dad, are we going to California? I said, no, we're going to Carolina. <laughs> and every day, every few hours, are we in California yet? Are we in California yet? No. So uh, they had their suitcases packed this week. And uh, I was gone last weekend. And uh, Erica told me that Andrew, right, the two-year-old, had a suitcase packed and came to her one morning and said, take me to the airport. I'm ready to go. Take me. And so, uh, so we'll get them out here the next time we come out. Uh, can I tell you just a couple of stories about them? I'm, I'm having too much fun. I'm telling you what, these boys coming in, uh, uh, being an older parent, coming in these years, we're having a great time. So uh, if you recall, I call Nathan Big Bear, uh, just a nickname that stuck the day I, I brought him home from the hospital. And then I call, uh, so then after about a year, we started calling Andrew Big A. So I got Big A and Big Bear. Well, a few months ago, we are uh, playing in the house, and uh, Nathan looked at me, Ray Big Bear looked at me, and said, I'm going to call you Big Gray. <laughs> I said, now, why would you do that? He said, because your hair is gray. <laughs> you know, kids say some funny stuff, and uh, they don't always remember what they said. And so on this particular occasion, I was just quiet, hoping right, he would forget, and Oh, about three weeks later, about a month later, we were playing hide-and-go-seek. Oh, man, I'm having so much fun, right? You get to be an older parent, and uh, we're playing hide-and-go-seek. I'm really good at hide-and-go-seek, right? Andrew calls it hide-and-sneaky. Playing hide-and-sneaky. So I've got a couple of spots that they still haven't found, and so uh, I don't... Uh, I'll wait for about 10, 15 minutes, and then uh, finally I'll just come out and reveal myself, because I want to keep that hiding spot really good. And uh, so I'm hiding away, and the boys are running through the house. They still can't find me, so they're getting Erica involved. Come on, Mom. you got to help us. We're desperate. And then they called out, Big Gray. Nathan's yelling, Big Gray. Come on out, Big Gray. Where are you, Big Gray? <laughs> I told my wife, I said, man, I'm in trouble. I think this is going to stick. <laughs> but then he made up for it. A little bit later, we were uh, coming around the corner. I was doing something, and... Uh, they were in the middle of uh, doing some Bible lessons. They were doing David and Goliath. That's one of their favorite ones, right? So we get a sock and we put it inside other socks, right? And they uh, make a sling out of it. Uh, you got to make sure there's only socks inside there. Every once in a while, there's like a rock or something in there. It changes the game completely. <laughs> and so I uh, came around the corner and, and Nathan stopped and said, oh, Dad, come here. You got you to gotta play with us. Uh, we're doing David and Goliath. Dad, you got to be Goliath because you are so tall. <laughs> <I> said, yeah. <laughs> so that is the first time ever in my life anyone has ever called me tall. <laughs> pause right there. So hold on a second. Hey, babe, come here, babe, babe, come here. Now, Nathan, 
tell your mother again what you said. Babe, this is awesome. You gotta hear this. <laughs> he's like, Dad, you are so tall. Right? And, and I know he's four, right? But it's, I'm 49 years old. It's the first time in my life. So I'm gonna take it, right? So uh, we're, we're having a great time. We're having uh, too much fun. And uh, God has been good to us. Amen. And so, uh, so that's life with a two-year-old and a four-year-old. You guys remember those, those days and stages. But we're just having a good time. Had a great time last night talking about working with people, right? This is a big emphasis that we uh, have been teaching and traveling and ministering on. Uh, coming up on 19 years. Go around the world doing this. Just had the opportunity to go to uh, Egypt uh, a couple of months back. I was there in Cairo. Cairo is a city of 35 million people. Um, it's much uh, bigger. Uh, they got too many cars, too many people, right, than what the infrastructure is able to handle. Uh, it's an amazing city. Man, I had a wonderful week. I had a wonderful time there with, with the believers. Uh, it's a very arid spot uh, a couple of hours in from the Mediterranean, so it, it rains on average one inch a year in Cairo. So it's an incredibly dusty city, uh, uh, just dust flying everywhere. Um, amazing belief. Amazing believers, wonderful people. And so when I worked with the Bible school there, the Bible school has been going for 10 years. And at this particular time, we did a class. We had a change of plans at the last minute. So we had 30 students come through. A handful of students were from South Sudan going to the university there. But I'm telling you, they were amazing believers who love Jesus Christ. I really felt at home with those Christians. But it's, they, uh, they live a much different life than we do. There's a great persecution there. Uh, they really have to be careful, uh, uh, just even the language and, and where they are, where they live. The, the Christians are not a favored group there in the country. So they don't live in the, the best parts of town overall. There are occasions uh, where when they become born again and just have a radical transformation, they do risk losing uh, everything out on their family being uh, ostracized from, from the parents and the family if the rest of the family is not born again. And so in the last 10 years, they actually have had 16 students, 16 Bible school students have been martyred in the last 10 years. And so when they accept Jesus Christ, it's a significant dedication, commitment, sacrifice in their life. And I'm telling you, it's very humbling, very humbling to meet these people, to work with these people. They will have youth events. You've got summer camp coming up this summer. We want to talk about that in a minute. But they also have youth events over there for the youth age and then a little bit older. And they'll have 1,000, 2,000 youth come to their events. And they have just big conferences and just tell them about Jesus. But also in the last 10 years, they have had to move um, thousands, about 3,000 young people out of the country in order to save their life. It's a similar to a, a witness protection program. These people, young people got born again, accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and then there's times where uh, now the family uh, is not happy about that. So they've moved thousands of young people to other countries around the world in order to protect them simply because they chose to follow Jesus Christ. And so, uh, man, I'm telling you, we had a wonderful time there. Uh, heaven is going to be a great place when we get there. There's going to be people from all over the world, so many stories. Uh, it's an honor, it's a, a privilege just traveling around the world. And I just wanted to share that with you, let you know, uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. With, uh, man, they're strong, they, are, they love Jesus Christ, they believe in healing, they believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I felt, even though they spoke a different language, I felt like I was at home with my own people, mm -hmm. just like you guys. And so we've been traveling all over the world just teaching on the importance of working with people. You are designed to be on a team. This is where you succeed. You have a gift. You don't have every gift, but you've got a gift. And the gift that you have has been designed by God to fit perfectly on a team. You look good on a team. And so the gospel that we have is a relational gospel. There's not one single gift that has been given by God that is meant to be utilized in isolation. Utilized for isolation. And so we've been traveling now for 18, 19 years just traveling 
all over, just learning about teams. And I've under, now I understand that there is a strong connection between the health and the strength of a church and the ability to work with people. There's a direct connection there. And so what we've been doing now for the last 10 years, we've really ramped up our focus and just encouraging people, find a team. You know, you are on multiple teams. If you're married, you and your, your spouse, you are a team. Your family is a team. Your immediate family is a team. Uh, at work, you're on a team, right? If you're in school, you're on a team. The classroom that you're on, you're really on multiple teams. Even in your neighborhood, there's a team of people that you work on. And so last night we had a lot of fun just going over some practical information. Introducing people in the church that are just wonderful idea people. Always thinking of a new idea, right? I know what we should do, right? And they come up with a new idea. We ought to try this. We ought to try that. And sometimes they come up with an idea and we think, oh my goodness, this is outrageous. You ever meet somebody like that? Mm -hmm. Here comes another idea guy. What are they going to come up with next? And then you've got on the other end, you've got people that, man, just love just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And they like that, right? And they make traditions out of this. And there's something great about traditions. And then we have people that run all the way in between, right? There's people who are organizers and get things done, right? There are people that like to work by themselves. There are people that like everybody to come, right? They want to make sure that everybody has a, has a part, has a chance to play. My wife is one of those. I call them a builder. My wife is an amazing builder. When she was there on the job, uh, she was a vice president with the bank back in Tulsa. And uh, she came up with her own form. She was a branch manager. And every employee that worked for her, uh, typically she would have uh, eight, eight to ten uh, employees at the branch working in all different areas. But she had her, uh, a sheet designed on her own, come up with, you know, what's their name? And, and has, she had them fill out, uh, what's your favorite compliment that you enjoy? What's your pet peeve working with people, right? What's a favorite snack that you have? When is your birthday? And what do you enjoy? And she kept a record of all that. And so when it came time for someone's birthday, she would go buy them the favorite snack. Every other month, she also would do like a food day. Hey, we're doing food. We're bringing, one time she'd bring in bagels. Stop early and get donuts, get bagels. Just, she's that kind of person that was always building people. Just getting people to enjoy it, right? And that, it was such a great idea. It's really, I just, honestly, working with people I'd never even thought of before. Right? When I show up working with a team, I'm showing up with a lot of ideas. And I really, I'm showing up with great ideas. And I think my ideas are awesome, Right? And yet she showed up wanting to realize, hey, does anyone else have an idea? I'll be honest with you, that was a novel concept for me. And we need all kinds of people. And so there has been a summer camp that I've been a part of uh, since 2007 down in Florida. It's about 30, 35 churches get together. We've had uh, up to 1,200 people showed up at the camp. And so I've been uh, just an honor and privilege to be a part of that, working behind the scenes, helping out. And this is where we have really have uh, just put into practice a lot of this that we've learned about working with people, the importance of it. Right? There's something about getting together on the job that the church gives you these opportunities to be a part of something that's bigger than you. Be a part of a vision that's greater than just uh, our own life, our going to work, or just being at home, a family. But there's a, something bigger that God wants to do through us. And he does it with us being connected together. We want to look at a passage there in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, I want to look at a couple of verses. We've been looking at this for a couple of years now with you. But we want to bring out some different things today. But in Ephesians 4, Paul starts talking about how Jesus Christ gave some gifts. Talks about he uh, ascended up from hell. Right? He died. He descended. And then he, he rose again. The Bible says when God raised him from the dead, then Jesus established the church. He said, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something new. We're no longer going to have insiders and outsiders. We're not just having Jews and Gentiles, but we're bringing everyone together into one body. We call this the church. And God said that he is establishing wisdom today, understanding through the church. He's working in the church today. And so we all make up the church. And yet we are all so different 
We have a different way of seeing things, a different way of understanding how we like to do things, and yet we all come together and God makes us into one group, right? And so a human body, we're the body of Christ, but that human body is a great illustration for how we fit together. You know, as I travel all over, I enjoy just seeing the differences in people, right? And there's all kinds of different things of how uh, people just process different information, right? And so now we're in that day and age where everybody's starting to get a smartphone, right? And when you look at the smartphone, there's so many different ways people do things, right? And it's just a different way of how people respond, right? Uh, for instance, when we set up apps, right? So there are people that just download all kinds of apps and just pile them onto just to there's just no organization to it. Then there's other people that like to put all the apps together into smaller and different groups, right? I use kind of a combination. I'll have a couple of groups, and then I'll have uh, just a couple of them. I, I kind of group them together, but I don't like full pages of apps. But there are other people. Anybody in here, you, you just have like a full page after page after page of apps on your phone? Anybody like to do it that way? A couple of you. I like to have a great picture, right? I got a picture of my boys on, on my uh, on my phone here, I don't know if you can see this, right? Here they are when they're little, right? And so I wanna be able to see the pictures, right? So whenever I screen in here, right? I've got, oh, see, you can't see, I've got a lot of apps on there, right? So I put just a couple of apps on there. Now, when I pick up my wife's phone, I can't find anything, right? You ever you borrow your spouse's phone? I think, like, what, what in the world are I, what, I, don't, I, can't, I can't find anything on this phone. <laughs> Babe, I need you to find, find the photos, find the right? It's just a different way of thinking, right? And at times I'll get together with friends and say, hey, what apps do you have? You know, man, that looks cool. Where did you get that from? There are so many apps out there. There's no way we can all know every single one of them. So I'm always learning. Uh, somebody told us years ago about an app for, uh, for groceries. Anybody have a groceries list app? I found a great one. I like it. It's called Our Groceries. And so this has a list. You can do multiple stores, put them on there, and actually it can connect with someone else if you want to. So my wife and I have connected this on our, on our list. So now whenever I'm shopping, right, I look at the list and I go to the store. Of course, I'll be honest with you, it's not too often because we are utilizing, what a great day we live in. We're utilizing the online purchasing. I don't know what you guys did before when you had kids. Did you actually have to take the kids shopping? Did you guys have to do this? Is that what you guys did? Did you take the kids with you to the grocery store? Right. We're spoiled today. I just get online. My wife is shopping right from the, from the living room. It takes us longer to drive a mile and a half to the grocery store than it does for them to load all the groceries that we picked, you know, online, load them in. But in the one occasion where I've got to go into the store, right, I'm checking the phone, just making sure. And then right before I check out, I always have to double check and make sure because she could kind of follow me and track me, right? She could see where I am in the store. But, oh, I need, I remember I forgot something else. And so for me, the deadline is uh, once I paid, right? If I paid, I have a lot of stuff, I am not going back in the store. <laughs> and yet we're all so different of how we set up the phone, how we process information, right? How we like to shop, where we like to shop. And we see the same differences here in the church. Right? We'll come into the church this morning and people are going to be talking about the songs. Man, I, I like that one song. I wish we'd go back and sing the one song. And somebody else says, man, that was a great song. I wish we would have just sung that song longer. Did anybody think that this morning? Right? Someone else says, why are we singing so many songs? We sang too many songs. Right? I think we should just sing two songs and then move on. Right? How come we have so many people up here? Someone else says, we need more people up here. Someone else says, why didn't we sing the entire time? We should have just sang the entire service. Come on, anybody feel like that? <laughs> and then someone else says, well, that music is too loud, right? I'm waiting till the music is over. Someone else says, it's not loud enough. Somebody else says, why are we meeting at 1030? We should meet at 930, right? The people that wake up early, where are you at, right? People that like to get up at 5 and 6, right? Been waiting for hours for church to start. You're looking at the rest of us like, what's, what's wrong, right? You feel like the church comes in the middle of the day. And then we got people that needed an alarm to get here by 10 a.m. You don't have to raise your hand. That's fine. <laughs> right? Got to get here before 10. I better set that alarm, right? All different. And I'm telling you, these differences are just with this group right here. Right here. And we look at God and we say, we're supposed to get along. He said, like, yeah. Romans, he said, man, as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. 
You have a part of the team. You're a vital part of the team, but there are many different kinds of people on the team. I like to equate it to having a toolbox. My boys are starting to utilize my tools, right? And they love Papa's tools, so I went and got them a toolbox of their own, so they got some, some uh, fun toys, some plastic toys, you know? They love it when they get to utilize tools. And so I, I uh, inherited tools from my dad, so I've got all his old stuff, you know, and just a, a big array of tools. And it's the same way. If you have many different kinds of tools, you could do a big job. But if you have very few and you have a lot of the same kind of tool, right? if your toolbox is 10 screwdrivers, you know, two Phillips, a number three Phillips, a number one Phillips, you know, a slotted, a stubby, a right hand, you know. You pick all those because you like, there's a connection there. If that's what your toolbox is, you're not able to do a big job. You could maybe, uh, what, tighten all the handles on the cabinets in the kitchen. But when it came time to do something big, you're limited. Man, if you're gonna do a big job, you need different tools. You need a saw, right? You need goggles, you need gloves, right? You got a socket set, you got a wrench, you got pliers, you got tin snips, right? And depending on the job, you may even have a chainsaw. But there's something about having all these tools that you don't utilize them on every single project, but you still need them to stay in the right place, stay in the toolbox. And this is what we talk about with people, right? We can equate people to being like a tool, at having a different ability, right? So if we talk through everybody here in the crowd, we can begin to equate them to something, right? Uh, let's talk about the hammer, right? The hammer is something that connects things, right? The hammer works great with the nail, right? Makes a lot of noise when they work. Come on, you know anybody is always just loud when they show up, just makes a lot of noise. You know every time they show up to work. Anybody you know like that, right? No need to point at any neighbors here. And yet the screwdriver works the same way, connects things, screwdriver works great with the screws, but just quietly does the same job where the nail is just banging away. Right? I've got one sister in particular who's just a quiet worker just like that, where if she's in the other room, you almost forget she's even there. But then there's other people when they show up, right? Show up like the hammer, just banging things. Hammer works great with the nail, right? The nail connects things. There are people that connect things and just keep things together. And yet when you compare the, the screw and the nail, right, uh, the nail, once it's in place, really likes to stay in place, right? In fact, it'll kind of work with you and you try to pull it out, right? Sometimes it'll get bent out of shape, right? There are people that like to stay in the one spot, right? When you have them there, man, I just want to stay right here. I just want to be right here. Get bent out of shape if you try to move them somewhere else. And yet the screw doesn't mind at all. Just move me somewhere else. Put me in a different direction. The saw works great with the, the tape measure, right? What's the rule? Measure twice, right? Cut once. Anybody ever make a mistake on that before? Oh, yeah, I have cut too much, and then you gotta start all over, right? And so when the saw, there's a person who's the saw, man, they just make it different, right? They just change things up. Things are completely different when they're done. And if you make a mistake, well then you gotta find Mr. Duct Tape, right? To help you, you know, to kind of piece things back together, put it back together. Then you got the, there's people that are similar to just, they love to just clean up at the end, man. They just come and they clean up all different kinds of people. And then there's the guy who's the sandpaper. Right? Just kind of irritates you, just kind of rubs you the wrong way. Ah, got anybody that you know that's kind of sandpaper in your life? We need that guy. We need the sandpaper. Right? Because that irritation is not for the sandpaper, it's for us. Because the truth is, if he loses that grit, he's no longer useful. And so there's all different kinds of people. And so your success will be dependent upon figuring out how to work with people. Your success on the job, success in the church, everything you do is dependent on your ability to work with people. And thank God you are not by yourself. Come on, the Holy Spirit is in the people business. He will help you. 
And so I've learned over time how to work with people. The Holy Spirit, he's still helping me. He's still teaching me. But one of the best ways of learning how to work with people is you've got to get a revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is to get you irritated and offended by people, to get you out of place, out of line. I'm convinced it's one of the biggest traps of the enemy. It's to get you offended, to get you to want to quit, to leave your place on the team, in the toolbox, in the church. Well, how come we're doing it that way? The answer is, don't keep going down that path being irritated with people. The answer is always looking at Jesus. Amen. Looking at Jesus. Do you remember the story of Zacchaeus? Growing up, right, we used to sing the song Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? That was never fun being pointed out. We ought to be Zacchaeus in the play. That was never fun. And so the story is Zacchaeus was a tax collector, a Republican, had a negative reputation, didn't like people, people didn't like him. And yet one day, Jesus is coming to see him. He hears Jesus is in town, but people are in his way, he can't see, right? So what does he do? You remember the story? You remember the song? What does that key is do? Climbed up, tree. Climbed up in the tree. And from the point of the tree where he can get up a little bit. Okay, now he sees Jesus. Come on, he got up above the people and he started to look at Jesus. Jesus saw him and said, man, I'm coming to your house. Nobody could believe it. Jesus is coming to his house? Does Jesus not know who he is? Yeah, he knew exactly who he was. And at the end of the night, Zacchaeus came back. Come on. He'd had a revelation of God, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Zacchaeus had a completely different way of working with people. And he came back and he told Jesus, listen, I am going to make restitution for everything I have taken advantage of. I am giving this away. I don't see anywhere in the scripture, in this story, where Jesus laid out the steps he needed to do. What I see is Zacchaeus receiving that revelation, receiving Jesus Christ and coming back and saying, here's what I'm going to do. And so on the end of the story, is Jesus said, salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus. And so if you're going to work with people, you're going to have to get your eyes off of them and you're going to have to fix them on Jesus Christ. I've been working on teams. I've been doing this for over 30 years now. This is one of the best answers that I have for you. If you keep looking at people, at times the potential is there to get irritated uh -huh. with people and want to quit. Yeah. Years ago, I graduated from Bible school and uh, you know, was looking at how do I get started? What should I do? And the opportunity came to volunteer in the, the youth department of my home church. I worked there for 11 years, over 11 years. 11 years, two months, two weeks, four days. <laughs> And I'm telling you, I had amazing opportunities to get offended and to want to quit. You know what? I'm done. I'm out. These people just don't value who I am. I just don't like them. But I stayed in there. I stayed in there. Over 11 years, I had amazing opportunities, come on down, to offend other people. Get them to want to quit. Right? But the Holy Spirit helps us. That's right. Gives us ideas how to get along with people. And so I just keep my eyes on Jesus. All right. Right. So I keep my eyes on the vision. Right? There's something great that the Holy Spirit will do on the inside of you. Come on. We have a relational gospel. And so there's something vital about working with people. The Holy Spirit is going to help you getting along with people. He will give you good ideas. Right? So for many years, though, I would just get irritated by people, and I would just tell God all the time what I thought of people. Have you ever been there before? Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you what I think about that guy. And then I started to make a change. And you know when that change came? The change came when I realized how good God had been to me. Amen. Right? We've talked about this, but I, I don't know that we can overstress mm -hmm. the importance of having a revelation of the love of God. Right. You treat people based on how you believe God treats you. Amen. If you keep people at a distance, it's because you believe God is keeping you at a distance. 
If you are critical and negative and criticize something, everything they do, it's because you believe God is being critical towards you. If you are tough to work with, it's because you believe God is being difficult with you. And I'm telling you, there was one day when I began to realize, wait, God's been good to me. God's been good to me. And it changed everything about my life. It changed how I shop, changed how I drive, changed how I saw my past. Changed how I saw people around me. There's something great just about when you get that revelation. I'm telling you, the love of God is so amazing. You can't figure it out with your mind, with your brain, with your head. It has to be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in the revelation business. He wants you to know. How do you ask? How do you find out? You just ask him, Father God, will you show me how much you love me? There's something dynamic. There are multiple times in my life where I realize, where God spoke to me, I realize He loves me. It comes alive in your heart. And so I remember being in traffic uh, that year uh, at Christmas time, just a couple months later, just getting that revelation. And it was like the first time. Where's my late time, uh, last minute Christmas shoppers? Anybody joining me, right? Like my last, like last minute Christmas shoppers. Like we're the ones that are out there. Like we start on December 20th. Anybody start? Right? And those, those people irritate us, don't they? Who already have everything done by Thanksgiving. I ordered, I shopped, you know? They give you a gift and you're like, I found this in July. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> there's, a, there's a last, there's a whole group of us. It, it feels like that group is growing. Last minute Christmas shoppers. We are either online or out of the stores. There's a desperation to us, right? You can tell. You can see it in their eyes. <laughs> you can see the people that are done, that are just enjoying being out. And then there's the rest of us that are like, uh, I just got to find something, right? Nothing means I love you more than just a last second gift at the 7-Eleven, right? <laughs> nothing means, nothing says you're so important to me that I just picked this up on the way, <laughs> you know, scratching out the car. I needed to say Christmas, you know? <laughs> And it's close, you know. Sorry what happened to you. You crossed that out. Merry Christmas. You know, Happy New Year. <laughs> and I remember sitting in that traffic. People all around were in the past. They would have been in my way. Get out of my way. I've got something to do. And I remember just sitting in there looking around at all the people. And it hit me. God has been so good to all of us. Amen. Come on. It just causes you just to take a deep breath. See, up to that point, I had been working to build my identity, my kingdom, building who I was, even as a volunteer in the church, even as a traveling minister, there still was an element there that I was trying to build who I was, build my identity. And I had no idea, but there's times where I would just be so defensive with you, and I didn't realize why until later when I realized it's because everything that I was, I was doing, I was trying to bring before God. I was trying to earn his approval. Mm -hmm. I was trying to be worthy of what he had done. And I'll be honest with you, when you're this way, the term is self-righteous. Right? You're, it's self, it's your identity, right? And I knew everything that I was good at, right? And I was building my identity, my reputation. And I wanted you to say, I really did, I wanted you to say, man, that David Fleming is awesome. That David Fleming is, I mean, is so organized. He is so great. And yet every project that I worked on, I just kept striking out. I kept making mistakes. I had to apologize every project I was on. But even then, the apologies were, were still self-righteous. You know, sorry about that, but, but I had to get the job done, right? And you knew that, right? Just kept running over people, and I was just building my identity, my kingdom. And the truth is, is when you're self-righteous, you are annoying to work. <laughs> Something about fear jumps in with us and just makes us annoying. Fear just takes a natural gift, a natural ability, a natural desire that we have and just jumps in with us and just drives us crazy, right? So for years being single, 
I thought, well, it would be nice to find a spouse. And then fear jumps in with you, right? And then you're just fearful, just trying to find somebody, right? I, I enjoy doing well at school, right? But then fear jumps in. I was like, I have to be the best. I have to be the best. I have to be the top of the class, right? And it just drives you. And the problem with self-righteousness is that once you begin to establish that, you can't go backwards. You have to do more. It's got to be even bigger. It's got to be even better. And as we progress through life, all of a sudden we become even more annoying and more irritating to work with. And right if we have anybody in our life that's like, man, I don't understand. They're just so crazy. One time they're one way, one time they're another. It's because fear has taken over in their life. Come on. And the only thing that broke fear in my life was realizing God has been good to me. Amen. And immediately when I got my eyes off of me onto Jesus, I began to realize God has been good to me. This is helping me now when I'm working my part on the team. You're designed to be on a team. While you're working with people, though, you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Yeah. You just keep thinking about how good God has been to you. Come on, this is going to help you. I remember years ago, I told you this story. I want to tell it again. I was volunteering there at a church a long time ago. They had a, a, an October event for children, right? We've seen those before. We're, we're going to do a bunch of games. Kids are going to get dressed up, and we're going to pass out candy. Well, I've done this many, many years, and so there's a, a church in Carolina where I, I jumped in and helped out with them, you know, volunteered for about 12 hours one day. I know how to do these projects, right, and I'm a, I, I'm a great asset, so I just jumped in and helped them and organized all the candy, sorted it all, and helped them with the games, and they asked me to run one of the games. So my particular game, the kids were given some rings and had to throw it on a dowel rod, you know, like they're going uh, fishing. And so then uh, they, they, I started out with a, a shoebox of candy. Do you remember this? Had a shoebox of candy, and so they told me, so we don't know how much candy we have, we don't know how many kids are coming. Just give them two pieces of candy, right? So I could follow directions, right? First cup child plays, and okay, here's two pieces of candy. Here's two pieces of candy. We're playing. And uh, there's about 20, 25 games outside. The kids can keep coming and playing. And some are doing well. Some aren't doing so well, right? But we're, you know, we're kind of giving some, passing out some candy. Well, they filled up my box of candy. So now it's heaping again. So now I'm passing out candy, passing out more. A couple times I'm actually presenting the box. Hey, would you like to pick? The kids are loving it. Their eyes light up. You know, they got this massive box. What should I pick? You know, uh, one boy, uh, Nathan, would just grab two. But Andrew's always the kind to, to stop and to think. It seems like it takes forever. Would you like a piece of candy? And he's like looking at it all, checking it all out. Like, just get the candy. Let's keep on going. We go through a few minutes later, they filled up the box again, they filled up the box, and all of a sudden now, the, the game started to change. I realized, we've got a lot of candy left over. There's only a few minutes left in this event. I've got to get rid of this candy. So we quit playing the game, no more games, right? And I'm handing out like three pieces and four pieces of candy, and I'm getting a handful, right? And bringing the kids over, right? We're not even doing the game anymore. I'm trying to get rid of the candy, and then she filled it up again. <laughs> Right? This lady, you know, who's filling this all up, she doesn't know, but there's a game, right? Uh, I'm playing against her, right? Who can get rid of the most candy, right? Can I, how much candy can I get rid of before she fills it back up? And at this point, I'm like moving out from the game. I'm like handing candy to the parents, right? Come on, the dads, they're standing back there. They're pretending they don't like the candy, you know, but do you want some candy? Yeah, I saw that sparkle in the eye. They want some candy too, yeah, right? And the kids are just grabbing it, right? And so now what happens is you don't have to play the game anymore. And what do you have to do? You just got to be near me and you're getting candy. And I'm passing out the candy and I'm passing out candy and I'm passing out candy, giving out the candy. This is the goodness of God. And I realized this is what I've been doing my entire life. I've been passing out candy. But as long as I had a limited view, I wasn't sure if God was good to me. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really sure, does God love me? I don't know what I... You know what I've done. I know the mistakes that I've made. I don't know that he loves me. And in that season of my life, 
I was limited in the candy that I passed out. How I treated people. I made you play a game. What was the game that you had to play? How did you treat David Fleming? <laughs> oh, you didn't do so well. No candy for you. <laughs> you did okay. Two pieces of candy. But move along. I don't know how much candy I have. I'm picking the candy. But when I got a revelation, we have so much candy. It changed the whole night. When I got a revelation, I have access to goodness. God has been so good to me. Hallelujah. How has he been good to me? Through Jesus Christ. He came and he found you. He sought you out. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, when you were dead in sins, you were an enemy of God. You weren't even thinking about God. He came and he found you. He gave his life. God loves you so much. Right. He did everything that was necessary to bring you back into fellowship, into communion, into abundance. Jesus Christ came and he declared the truth. He said, listen, the enemy is the one who has been stealing from you, killing and destroying. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There's an abundance to grace. There's an abundance and you can't qualify for it. You can't earn it on your own. Amen. You qualify for it because of what Jesus Christ did for you and all you have Amen. to do is believe and accept and confess, yeah, I need a savior. I need help. I can't do this on my own. And immediately, you qualify for abundance. You qualify for candy after candy after candy after candy. And so now, no longer do we have to evaluate people based on their performance to us. Amen. See, when I had limited candy, I was watching how you played the game. But when I realized I've got too much, I have access to too much goodness, i got to get rid of this. Right? Once I realize that, there's no more game, I'm just handing out candy, handing out candy. you just got to be near me. That's the game. The game is, who can I be around? Yeah. You go back into the presence of God. Didn't you enjoy that worship this morning? Amen. Right? You go back into the presence of God. You begin to worship. You begin to read the word of God. And he just, come on, daily. He loads us with benefits. Do you remember yes. that verse yes. in the Psalms? Yes. Right? Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. My cup runs over. God has been so good to you. Amen. Amen. You qualify for abundance today. Yes. Now. Yes. This week. You qualify for incredible favor today, this week, now. Amen. Because of Jesus Christ. Thank you. It's not what I did. It's not what you did. We could never earn it. And so this is now the attitude we take being on the team. Because we're going to work with people that are going to try to take our candy. We're going to work with people that years ago we thought, you don't qualify for it, can't be. I'm not giving it to you. But there's something powerful that happened when I realized I have access to unlimited candy. It changed everything about what I was doing. And come on, when we realize you have access to goodness. <clears throat> This is going to change how you view people, how you work with people. Mm -hmm. God has been so good to us. Amen. He's been good to us. And this is meant to be practical and to actually help us day to day. 
And so that's why I can change how I drive now. I actually let somebody in. I honk the horn less. Because I'm looking at Jesus. Oh, he's been good to me. Amen. Amen. I know they didn't think that through. This is not where they should be turning left. This is the wrong spot, but that's okay. able to be good to people where years ago I would have been evaluating now do they qualify Does you, should you you're going to need this to stay on the team you've got to have that view of abundance because you are going to be on a project where somebody does take advantage of you you are going to work. Come on, there's, there's things that we do in the church, man. I'm all for being part of the local church, being a part of the team. And there's times where you're going to have to show up early. There's going to be times where you show up and nobody recognizes you for what you've done. Come on, God sees everything that you do. There's times you're going to be dirty. There's times you're going to get your, you, you, right, your hands dirty. You're going to be tired. You're going to be exhausted. Man, I'm a big fan of, of summer camp. Do you realize that as adults? Do you realize what God can do in your life when you go to youth camp at this age? Come on, it's not just for the kids. Come on. There's something that God can invest in your life. You've got the opportunity, brother, for one more person, had the opportunity to be a part of summer camp. Right? Come on, you're going to invest four days in the kingdom of God. And God is going to just, uh, just keep adding to you. There's an abundance that comes in. Right? You dedicate that time. Right? Some of you, you might take a, a vacation time, time off from work. But you cannot outgive God. You cannot out-invest Him. Every right. investment that you make. Come on, and so when I go to summer camp, I've been going to youth camp since 2007. Right? Come on, God speaks to me. So we know that God is always speaking, but there's just something about getting the young people together for like four days in the presence of God, away from the phones, away from the computer, away from, and just allowing them, because we know God is always speaking, but sometimes it just takes time for us to get quiet to hear. I mean, I wish I had, had days and days and days to tell you all the stories of just the relationships, the connections that I've made with people. This camp that I'm a part of, I actually met this one couple uh, who invited me to be a part of this. I met them uh, back in 1993, 20, what is it, almost 27 years ago. It just seemed good to go volunteer in the youth. Right? God doesn't always speak to you, you know, audibly, you know. He doesn't send you a message on Facebook or a message in the clouds, you know, go be a part of this. I just on my own just kind of felt like, man, it just seems good to go work with the youth department. I don't know. It just seems good to do that. And there was a couple that I met that first day, right? And so the last 27 years, they have consistently invested into my life. I would not be where I am today without their friendship without their connection. We started out just doing small events together and, and now we've worked to the point where uh, they've got their own church. They've been bringing a lot of workers to summer camp and just the last uh, five, seven years, I've been just doing new workshops with them and new material and, and just the whole team has just invested greatly into my life. And it all started because one time, years ago, back in 1992, it just seemed good. I guess maybe I'll go help with the youth. I'll go see if they need help one time. We know in the natural there are seeds that you sow, you get a one-time harvest. But there are also seeds that you plant that once that tree begins to grow, you get a harvest year after year after year after year after year. This is how God has designed relationships. You come in and you get involved in the church, and there's going to be divine connections, divine relationships. That you're going to look back in 10 years, and you're going to think, man, I had no idea how powerful that relationship was going to be. You know, for me, uh, we have a good time telling the one story. Um, part of one reason why I'm here is because years ago, I had a job behind the scenes at a Bible school, and I was just giving my best. I knew I was called to preach, and yet the church asked me to go cut the grass, set up tables and chairs, work behind the scenes. And I had my diploma. I wanted to preach. And they said, well, can you help us pick up some trash, clean up? 
set up some lunches. So one particular day, I'm just kind of walking through the lobby, just, I gave my best right where I was, even <laughs> though I knew, yeah, he knows where I'm going. Gave my best right in front of me, even though that wasn't the dream that I had. And I found a badge on the floor. Hey, somebody lost a badge here. responsible. Look at this, what does this say? It says, Luke Joey Jacobs. Hey, I know this guy, but I didn't know his middle name was Joey. <laughs> and I don't know if a year goes by, we don't mention the name or the story. <laughs> right? Holy Ghost is bringing us together. Come on, he does it funny ways, right? He doesn't always say, go meet that person, great, right, because they're going to be a great investment into your life. He doesn't say it that way. He just kind of nudges you. Hey, why don't you go to camp? Hey, why don't you get involved in the children's? Hey, why don't you help with the grass? Hey, why don't you see if they need anything online? Sometimes it comes so subtle, you actually think it was your idea. And you can actually talk yourself out of it. Well, you'll look around. I don't know that I'm that good to play. I don't know that I'm that great with the kids. I don't know if, I don't know if, come on, follow those impressions. Come on, the Holy Spirit's leading you. Mm -hmm. Follow that. Follow that. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Right. Keep going over That's the story right. of Jesus, what he has done for you. He has been so good to you. so many stories. I tell you how I, how I met my wife. I met her through Rochelle, good friend Rochelle. We were hanging out in a group and Rochelle said, hey, my friend Erica's going to come hang out with us today. I didn't realize she's going to be my wife in a couple of years. She just said, it's good. A friend of ours going to hang out. Just wanted her to meet some more people. Well, I met through Rochelle through Julie. I had volunteered with Julie there in the youth department. Uh, we had a good time with just a group of us volunteering, working together. I met Julie because Julie was actually roommates with Christina. So I worked with Christina, right? I told you about the times where I'm setting up tables and chairs. Well, sometimes I needed help doing that. So the people on the light crew, the Christmas light crew, my church puts up two million Christmas lights. So they came and helped me. And so I got to be friends with Christina and, and the other 20 people on the crew. And one day Christina said, hey, I'm having a graduation party at my house. Why don't you come? And I'd already been traveling and I thought, well, yeah, this would be great. Go meet some more people. So I went to her party, and that's when I met her roommate, Julie. But I met Christina because Christina worked for Steve. Steve is the one that ran the tool crib. Now, Steve is a, a, just a great guy. I worked with Steve for a couple years on one of those jobs. Steve was uh, just the, the perfect guy just doing uh, tools. Tool repair, man, I learned so much from this guy. He understands space and packing and, and everything like that. He told me a story one time. Uh, I just learned so much about tools. I didn't know much at all. So I just, purpose, I realized this guy knows a lot. I'll just put aside what I know and you just tell me everything you know. So he told me about all the different tools, walk behind, cut, you know, uh, cut quick saw, you know, some real great stuff. He was telling me a story one time about uh, cleaning up the concrete tools. He said, well, you want to get right on it. Clean those tools as soon as they come in because they get dirty. Yeah. Otherwise, right, if you don't do that, you're going to need to use elbow grease to clean them up. Well, I'd never heard that term, elbow grease, before. So I asked him, where do you get the elbow grease from? <laughs> Quick as a flash, he said, you go to the garage. Down there at the garage, they've got elbow grease for you. And if they don't have it, just tell Don, and Don, he keeps it on the one shelf here in the cabinet, you know, and if he's out, they'll just order some more, bring it out to you. I said, great, you know, I'm like, all this down. He started laughing at me, what, Fleming? No, elbow grease, you know, you just gotta work hard at it, you know? Never heard that before, you know, so we had some great time. So then when he got promoted on to the light crew, he said, Fleming, I'm going to send everybody to you. And this was where my team building really picked up steam. When I began to understand different people can do different things. How do I work with people? And so when I got to be friends with these people. At this particular day, they were hanging Christmas lights. But what I didn't know is that in a couple of years, God was calling me to travel. And I have literally traveled the world on those relationships. People, when I was just giving my best, setting up tables and chairs. 
Come on, your destiny starts today. Well, give your best right where you are, what God has in front of you. Come on, give your best. This is where it takes off. But I met Steve one day because uh, one day uh, I, I, uh, I really got irritated with Steve before I got into that department. There was one day. Steve was kind of a, a black and a white guy. And uh, sometimes he, if you didn't understand how he was asking the questions, and he just started to irritate me one day. Have you ever been there before? Not you guys. You guys are so nice. <laughs> you ever just wanted to give somebody a piece of your mind? Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do one day. And so I'm like standing in line waiting. There's like eight, nine guys. And I just got irritated waiting. You know? And I was like, just come on. Don't give it a hard time. Just help us out here. Oh, thank God for the Holy Spirit. He tapped me on the shoulder. Be quiet. Calm down. Come on, the Holy Spirit will help you. Come on, he's going to help you on the job. Correct. He's not only is he going to promote you, he's also going to help you keep your mouth shut when you need to keep your mouth shut. Amen. He's going to help you. Come on, he'll help you with the spouse, right? He'll give you some good things to say to the spouse and help you not to say the things that are about to get you in trouble with the spouse. He's going to help us. Come on, he's in the business of strong marriages and strong relationships and strong families and strong people. And so I just went and got a drink of water and just calmed down, right? I came back and there was no line anymore. And I thought, I'm just going to be quiet. So here's what I need and thank you and move on. I had no idea they were looking to promote somebody into that department. And guess who was promoted three months later to the department? Guess who might not have been promoted into that department had he given that guy a piece of his mind? <laughs> Kept my mouth shut one day. Years later, I met my wife. Ha. Come on, God uses people in your life. If you've been blessed by the ministry today and this message and would like to donate to David Fleming Ministries, then head over to FlemingMinistries.org and give online um, and... Uh, and bless David and Erica in the way that you've been blessed today.